Thanks a lot. So what I want to do, we've heard from two industries, I think, that um, are more mature. So now we're moving into the newer area, although I've been doing nanotechnology for 20 years, so I guess it's not that new. Um, but really what I had hoped to do is highlight sort of three phases of development that I've gone through as a nanotechnologist with respect to sort of what I understand about the community that studies really small stuff and what the communication challenges have been at each of those stages. And hopefully provide all of you who have a much harder problem to study than my own, um, to what extent things you learn about the science of science communications will depend on the discipline and the particular stage it might be at. That's a super relevant question to consider, especially as we move forward with new, new technology. Okay, so this is one of the most beautiful pictures in the world. Uh, this is a picture of a nanoparticle that I made as a graduate student, and it's a gorgeous photograph. Um, because you're looking at columns of atoms, those little white dots are actually atoms of cadmium uh, in a lattice. And I like the picture because it conveys, besides just being pretty, um, that nanoparticles are small. This is a very tiny piece of matter. It's bigger than a molecule. But this cadmium selenide nanocrystal, which you find in a lot of photo detectors and cameras, is now so small that it can get into your body and interact with you in new kinds of ways. It's perfect. It's very crystalline. And because of that, its properties are very different from the bulk material. And that's really the basis of a lot of nanoscience, is the idea that when you make a material small, whether it's rust or this cadmium selenide, also known as a quantum dot, you create properties that are very, very different. And that's strictly because of the size, not because of the composition. My favorite example is gold. We think of it as really inert. When you make it nano-sized, it can oxidize carbon monoxide. And that's strictly because it's only got about 20 atoms of gold as opposed to 10 to the 23 atoms. And that's really the basis of nanotechnology is utilizing these materials. So one of the first things that we, I think, was this communications issue that the scientists addressed to the community was that this is what people wanted nanotechnology to be. <laughs> um, they wanted it to be weird molecular assemblers that could push atoms together. One of the definitions of nanotech is that it's you know, precise positioning of atoms, which you could argue the picture I showed you before is a precise positioning of, in that case, about 1,000 atoms. Um, the Borg nanoprobes I love. You know, there's a lot of science fiction in the 80s and the 90s, and then the elevators to space made with carbon nanotubes. So in this particular field, science fiction and the sort of baseline exposure of the public to nanotechnology created one of the concepts of maybe what it could be. And so we sort of had a dual problem when I talked to grandma or my cousins about these issues who, who haven't gone to college. It was sort of like, well, you're working on nanobots. How cool is that? And it's like, well, no, actually, I'm working on better kinds of sunscreen. And so there was sort of a, how do you come, coming down to earth? And I think also this concept that the nanomaterials were going to be distributed. It wasn't one industry or one thing, but you would see it in everything from the aerospace industry to your doctor's office. And that's actually one of the biggest challenges, I think, in getting into this community. So that takes you up until about the 1990s. And then probably from my perspective, one of the most looking back, important things that happened to this community was I call it supersized science. I wanted to put up a picture of a supersized thing and I decided that wasn't a good image. But the idea is that in order to really get public support for science, we are now forced, and I think it's a good thing, to take really interesting scientific questions and to bundle them and sell them as large initiatives. This has happened from the climate change, National Nanotech Initiative, which supported this community. You're seeing it develop in robotics and in other areas. It's a way in which we can sort of say, it's not just some really cool paper, but this entire new discipline which will fund the next industrial revolution. And it's that kind of language that laid the foundation in 2001 for a nationwide investment which has now amounted to over $6 billion. The reason I point that out is I think it gets back to Dietram's point. There's a political climate around nanotechnology and many new emerging technologies that are en engaging with that. So what are the consequences of that? Well, one of the interesting ones is, this is a framing, by the way, <laughs> is um, you actually call a lot of attention to a community that might be very disparate. And so right after and right around the time that this became a national initiative, there started to become a lot of people interested in the consequences and critiquing it. This is, of course, an easy one for me as a scientist to deal with because people were worried that there would be flesh-eating nanobots that would destroy the world. And I, as a scientist, could credibly say with a straight face, 
you know, that's maybe a problem for the 22nd century, but not right now, um, because we can't make those kinds of things. But there were more nuanced discussions about the potential for these nanomaterials to be new kinds of pollutants or new kinds of toxins that perhaps because the materials were different and particularly because they were small enough to interact with biological systems, I mean, a rock can hit you on the head, but it's an entirely other thing when it's small enough to actually interact with the proteins that might make up some key issues in your digestive tract. And so these are some of the stories that were coming out around 2004, both not in my backyard stories, um, a lot of uh, local activity in Wisconsin and Cambridge and Berkeley pushing back on nanotechnology facilities, as well as national dialogues about what we know and don't know about the risk of nanotechnology. And I think a lot of that conversation came from that sort of supersized concept. So this is really the situation, I love this cartoon, um, because the reality is risk in nanotechnology is really complicated. Um, and there was never a clear answer, and there still isn't a clear answer, and I could give an hour lecture on some of the complexities, but really this was one of the challenges when we're saying, you know, being asked, okay, you're making sunscreens, what are they going to do long term, or you're making a new kind of fertilizer with a nanoparticle in it, what are the long term consequences of that, and it was a very complicated question. One of the reasons for that, and this is from some work I do in environmental impacts of nanotechnology, is that we have thousands of different sizes of nanomaterials. I didn't talk about their surfaces, but they're coated. Um, and when they hit an environment or your body, they undergo a remarkable number of different transformations. So we usually think of a toxicant as something that's always the same. You know, arsenic is always the same no matter where it is. If I have a nanoparticle that's entering your body because you ate it in a McDonald's milkshake, and yes, they're in McDonald's milkshakes, um, that's going to be really different than if that nanoparticle finds its way to you in another fashion because it may become degraded or coated or aggregated along the way. That's one of the many complexities we face in talking about the risk and actually studying it scientifically. One area that I think actually has worked well in this context has been the recognition that no one person, no one stakeholder could talk about this complexity. And so this is a, a website, it's from the International Council on Nanotech, which is pretty much dormant now. It had its time in the sun in about, I'd say, 2004 to 2008. But this was a group of stakeholders, NGOs, governments from across the world, a number of large academic research centers, such as the one at Rice, as well as companies who came together with the sole purpose of, of taking the debate about nanotechnology's risks to the highest possible technical level. We didn't know if it was going to be safe or not. That's a very tough question. But what we realized is that when one of those stakeholders tried to communicate, it was generally a disaster. Um, and so what we did is a lot of different things. This is an example of putting the research into context. There was a paper that was published by actually two different groups almost simultaneously about carbon nanotubes and mesothelioma. If you don't know what that is, the, the newspaper headlines could have read carbon nanotubes, a new kind of asbestos. And by the way, those are the carbon nanotubes that are now in the skin of the new Boeing Dreamliner, so it's not as if we're not using them. In any case, ICON would take those kinds of, act those kinds of stories, which people would bring to us hmm. pre-publication, interview a lot of different people about them, and put up this kind of information. Now, your average public wouldn't read this, but policymakers read it, and actually other scientists read it. So it created a very interesting um, source of neutral information that I think was very important for the community. I'd say the last challenge that we face, and this is really kind of where we're at, I think that hopefully you'll talk a lot about risk in this conference, but I want to point out one of the other areas that I think is emerging for us in nanotechnology now that we're maturing, maybe we're adolescents now instead of babies, um, is the recognition that the investment that our nation has made in this area is really enormous. And in fact, that was predicated on two things. One was hope, a hope of a new economy, and the other was fear. Fear that maybe the Chinese or the Russians would have technology we didn't realize and we couldn't understand. And those were the two basis, you know, sort of basic ways in which those, those arguments were made for investments in the basic research in this area. So what you see on the left is kind of a prediction from NSF of the market size of $1 trillion. And what you're really going to be, I think, seeing in the next five to ten years is what happens when you now have to deliver or somebody has to communicate what actually has happened as a result of this investment against that promise that was made. And so there's a lot of sort of internal discussions about managing expectations is the code word, but it really is how are we going to explain what impact this has had.
And under normal conditions, getting an NSF grant, doing some good work, publishing good papers, that's all you'd worry about. But this is a new sort of territory. And it's interesting to me, I don't know who will communicate it or who should, but I do know it's an important dialogue to have with the public because for the future of science, we have to be able to get that kind of investment in what we do. And so we have to be able to go back and say, okay, here's what happened as a result of the investment that you did make in this area. So with that, um, I hope that I've given you some things to think about and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you.